So as we are moving into the discussion phase, one of the things that strike me most is how Europe as a whole imagines itself in this global conflict. Do we consider ourselves as one entity in the West or we are entirely involved with the West? And my question would be, will this crisis prompt Europe to move forward strategic autonomy as a continent when it comes to these global conflicts? Or will we further integrate into the West and we become more, we strike more closer cooperation with the US, for example, in the NATO, for example? Is Europe going to be sovereign or we are going to be a larger entity in the future? Let's say, Thomas. Uh, no, I don't think Europe will be able to do that, and I would not be interested in Europe doing that either, if I should say it from a normative position. I think that um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon and the Atlantic uh, bonds are, have been very important for Europe in order to balance itself. And uh, uh, what Europe usually does when Europe is, is, is on its own is to fall into European civil wars. <laughs> and and uh, uh, unfortunately, the European civil wars have been actually, I mean, the First World War or the, uh, the German-French uh, War of 1870 or the Crimean War of uh, even before 1852 to 56 were very bloody or sanguine affairs because Europeans know how to fight and kill better than anyone else. So uh, actually, colonial wars are much easily won against uh, smaller uh, colonial, uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, countries and, and societies, more, more actually also from a, uh, from a military point of view, more primitive societies. So the American presence and the American interference and the American positions in Europe has actually been for the good of Europe. Not always, of, of course, Wilson's 14 points actually, in a way, when implemented, more or less was very detrimental for the European security issue. So we have to balance that too. It hasn't been always a, a good influence. But I think that the Europe that loses the transatlantic bonds will be uh, on its own. And, and I, I, th I think many European countries wouldn't want that either. It will be probably more dominated by in the continent by the French, or if the Germans step up by the Germans, uh, and, also, uh, uh, on, on, and, and also in the Northern Atlantic probably by, by Great, Great Britain, which would be actually a bit more, from my point of view, a bit better influence than what, what, what Germany and France would do. So I, but I stopped there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I agree with uh, Thomas that uh, I think that the war has uh, definitely showed the strength of the transatlantic uh, li link and uh, the necessity that we uh, keep it. Uh, still, uh, maybe a lot of uh, European countries, including Sweden, has uh, started to think about their military defense and so on, that we will see another will that we said before, uh, seen before, just in order to uh, increase your spending on defense and so on, that we will get more serious about uh, our own business, of course. Uh, yeah, I think I stopped there. <laughs> so about strategic autonomy, of course, we hear that for a quite a long time. Uh, I definitely believe that European countries should spend more, much more on their militaries and and I think that there is a place to work together as EU countries on issues. Uh, because the US is not interested in everything. So we should have more capabilities uh, to, to deploy, more capabilities, more fighting capabilities, actually, because we now have bureaucrat armies. Half of the army is just putting papers to one, from one chef to another. And <laughs> Not in every country. So Finland is a bit different, but it, many NATO countries are bureaucratic armies with relatively little fighting force and relatively huge ministries. I know because I've worked in the Hungarian Ministry of Defense 16 years, and the ministry was huge, and the fighting army was not that huge compared to the head of, the, of all of the military, and we changed that in the last six years. Actually, Hungary has one of the biggest rearmament programs compared to the mm. size of the country in whole Europe. But we should do it, do it on a European level. But still, if we completely rearm ourselves, one thing should be noted. It takes 10 years to do this. If we decide today a program to rebuild a German army, even with money, is going to be at least 10 years. So what kind of strategic autonomy till then? If you look at the French army, and no offense to France, I mean, we talk about maybe 200 Leclerc main battle tanks. 
200 tanks. I mean, Ukraine lost almost 200 tanks now. Russia lost six, 700 tanks. Uh, and German also is like this size. Of course, these, these tanks are better than, um, than the Russian uh, made tanks, but still these are small armies comparatively. So what I think that for a while, the without the United States, Europe is a paper tiger, and, and for quite a long time we cannot replace the US hard armor. Uh, only issue uh, which I think we should think about realistically that where the United States will be in 10 years. Will they, will they be here the way they are here now because of the Russian invasion? If you look back half a year, what kind of debates there were between France and the United States because of AUKUS within the United States that, okay, we don't have good roads, we don't have good uh, infrastructure, uh, other type of infrastructure, and we are still spending on the world so much. You know, one day a United States president can come, not like Trump, but maybe even more Trumpian, who says that, yes, thank you, world, either you pay up or we leave, or whatever, even if you pay up, we leave. So to, to, to place everything in the US is a bit of dangerous, but one thing, must then be changed. European stance on nuclear arms. Mm. Um, because 45% of nuclear arms are in Russia, another 45 in the United States, and the remaining 10 is between several countries. So these, we are small. France, French nuclear deterrent, deterrent is small. But of course, that's also a problem. I mean, can you imagine green Germany uh, you know, supporting a European nuclear rearmament? So, I see a lot of pitfalls in this, that to be, to be short, we just can hope and pray that the US remains focused on Europe for a long time. We were talking about military defense, but I think one topic that we have kind of neglected was energy security. And to keep the question short, can we become independent of Russian energy? And if so, how? And should we become independent of Russian energy? Um, so, well, it's very easy to answer the first question, yes. The okay. second, we should. And the second, <laughs> we were actually, Sweden had one of the best designed energy structure systems in maybe in the world uh, with a lot of uh, uh, redundancy, with, with, with uh, very much uh, hydropower and nuclear power that made up approximately 80 to 90 percent of all uh, all electrical uh, production, and which we, in 40 years, in total lack of understanding of things and by uh, utterly stupid political decisions, without any, uh, even any um, studies, uh, the last energy study in Sweden was done in 1978, uh, a, a com comparative uh, co uh, energy study. Uh, of, of, of energy systems. So yes, we, we could do that. Uh, however, we do need to take decisions on nuclear <laughs> uh, on, on nuclear energy as, as much as we do need to take decisions on nuclear weapons. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the same. Uh, first, of course, if we understand <coughs> why do we trade energy with uh, Russia altogether, well, it has to do with the, all these uh, liberal theories that states that uh, trade with each other, they will never go to war against <laughs> each other. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting, because if you look into how did the Cold War end? Well, in the US, they say that, well, it was uh, the Cold War that we were uh, rearming ourselves, and the Soviet Union could not follow us, and that's, uh, they went uh, in, into bankruptcy. And that's why uh, the Soviet Union lost. Ask a German, and the German answer is more that no, it has to be do with our appeasement uh, uh, policies that we built confidence with uh, the Eastern European countries that we started to trade, for instance, in energy and so on. And that was what ended the war, that we could overcome all these ideological differences between us. And I can say that this German, more German perception is false. Uh, of course, it has been uh, beneficial for us economically, maybe, to trade with uh, Russian energy and so on. And uh, Russia, of course, it has been beneficial for Russia as well. But they used this income against us by arming themselves, and now they're pre preparing to go to war in Europe. So, I mean, we really do have to get rid of uh, Russian energy. And like uh, Thomas here, I think it's uh, technically it's possible. Probably the future then will, will become more 
in, into a nuclear energy, of course, at least for the time being. But may, uh, maybe that's the step that, that we really have to take. So I believe that technically it's possible, but it's different for every country. Mm. So Sweden Definitely. is in one um, very lucky position. I think what Germany did in the last 12 years was nothing more and nothing less than shooting itself in the, sh in the foot, uh, with closing perfectly working nuclear power plants, with putting all the bets on Russia. Uh, and actually, uh, Germans deci Germany's decisions decided that for many countries it's impossible to do it in the short term. It's impossible, I think, even for, for Germany. It's definitely impossible for countries to do it in a short term like Hungary, Slovakia, and Austria. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's not because that we were uh, so stupid not to seek for other sources. We did. Um, and we, we, of course, supported building of an LNG port in Croatia. We supported, we tried the, supported to cooperate, uh, we tried to cooperate with Romania on, on, on the f gas fields on the Black Sea. It didn't happen for five years. So now we need time, at least in the case of Hungary, Slovakia, and some others. Because on the short term, if we, if we just finish buying uh, Russian gas and oil, would mean is, is the freeze and collapse of the economy. So would it help, actually, Ukraine? We get the oil through Ukraine. And Russia is paying for Ukraine today during the war for, for Ukraine for this transfer and for the gas France transfer too. So this is a strange war, <laughs> believe me, <laughs> that Ukraine is getting paid by Russia for these transfers. And if these transfers are stopped, by the way, and it's always forgotten, what is the interest of Russia not to destroy all of the energy system of Ukraine? Mm. They can do it. They can do it easily. Because these are compressor stations, these are pipeline. Nothing is easier to destroy than an oil and gas pipeline. It will destroy itself after the first strike. Mm. So we are in a, in a bit, bit, bit in a pink world when we think that there is a good solution for everything. It's not a Hollywood movie. With the, I mean, at the end, the, the heroes are, you know, there is the sunset and they are happy and leave. No. Uh, we need to do this for our sake, and I think in Hungary we agreed on this, that we will not do this, but it may take time for several countries. And I think it, it would be detrimental to, to be very swift for Ukraine too, because Russia is not yet fully unchained, believe me. It's not a total war yet. Mm -hmm. But if they do a total war, Ukraine will not be... Uh, Self, uh, I mean, uh, already I think the Ukrainian economy is very much down. So it's, uh, it's, it's never discussed really in the West how, 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 what the situation Ukrainian economy is now and how much, not military economic help they need. But with that, Russia could, could destroy basically the future of, of Ukraine. So I would be very cautious and I would be, in, if I would be a European Union commissioner, I would, be, I would say that, okay, some countries do it, some others don't do this, or, or in, a, in a longer time frame. And already, if many countries buy less, that would be already a hit for Russia. But I have to tell you that uh, actually Russia can reroute much of its energy exports. Not today, maybe not tomorrow, but they are t already doing this to China, to India, and they will buy mm. cheap Russian oil and gas. So, you can say that we are helping Russia to arm, but actually they can sell it elsewhere. And if the prices are high, every dollar hike in uh, oil price is $2 billion for the Russian budget. So to talk, even to talk about oil embargo is helping Russians to earn more today because this talking is raising the prices. So we have to be really calm and not to be like usually the mainstream press is just to believe that wishing something is reality. You have to calculate every move in a mathematical manner and not wishing results from, oh, it's, it's just punishing Russia. No, maybe we are even helping Russia uh, with this. So j just be cautious about this. Sorry, yeah. could I? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Uh, Go ahead. Just a comment on what something Thomas said uh, okay. uh, on, on, on uh, the idea that countries that trade with each other do not make war. This is, this is, a, this is a very old fallacy and has been disproven again yeah. and again. But also it's important from a, um, to, to differ between economic logic and statecraft logic 
which means that in a way a country has to be resilient, resilient, sorry, and and and, and able to cope in in crisis. Which means that also during the COVID crisis, we saw actually the idea of from a, from a business point of view that just in time didn't work. So you had to actually hedge for just in case, not just in time. Mm -hmm. So countries much be, must be much more just in case countries rather than just in time countries. Because when you face a crisis, it takes up to 10, 15 years to change military systems, energy systems. So we can't just be um, in a, in a in, what, what, what you could say is the, is the fallacy of uh, economic liberalism attached to statecraft, that we can't conduct the affairs of the state as if it was a company that could make things just in time. No, it has to be just in case. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, my comment uh, as well. Just to understand what a gas market or, uh, gas market or um, oil market is when we are talking about pipelines, is that these are usually natural monopolies. That means that for a large part of Europe, the only seller, possible seller for uh, natural gas is Russia through its pipelines. If we would like to get another distributor, we need to get gas from other countries, but that means that we need to build a lot more LNG terminals in order to get rid of this pipeline gas, so to speak. Uh, Lithuania, for instance, was a country that was very dependent on uh, Russian gas, and a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, I think now, uh, they built an LNG terminal that, uh, that made them more, uh, more or less independent then of uh, Russian uh, pipeline gas. So this, these are very complicated issues, and it will take time. It's not just a question of will. It's a big question of infrastructure. If you have the infrastructure to get other uh, gas from other, from other countries and so on, or if you don't. If you don't, you don't. You rely on uh, Russia. Uh, but also uh, another point is that, uh, yes, for a moment, uh, as I understand, I don't think that Russia can sell its pipeline gas to... Uh, to uh, China, because that gas that's coming to Europe now, it's from the western part of Siberia, and that is not connected with the eastern part and uh, later on to, to, uh, to uh, China. So it means that Russia also needs a couple of years in, uh, b before these uh, pipelines will be built. Yeah, just one remark, uh, gas fields can be totally stopped without destroying the gas fields. Oil fields are, uh, all the oil fields are a bit different, so Russia can just turn down the gas. And as far as I know, Putin, he can even just turn up the gas and flare it and have a cigar next to it. So the Russians can do a lot. But of course, you need three, four, five years to build the pipeline systems, at least. Uh, and one remark, uh, you know, there is very different, there is, it's, it's different to be Lithuania or Poland with seaside, and it's different to be Hungary, Austria, or Slovakia, or Czech Republic without seaside. We cannot make things happen without agreeing with other countries. And it's not that easy all the time. So actually for Hungary, it's only Croatia uh, that, that, can, that can easily help. And they have an LNG, it's not that big, but even with LNG ports, imagine, it takes time, it takes a huge investment. It takes a huge investment to build LNG ships because not only ports are missing, missing but ships are missing. So we do all the investment in LNG ports and ships and by the time we get there that we have enough LNG, uh, we don't need that much gas anymore because every country is turning to green, uh, greener resources. In Hungary, there is a big program uh, to, to establish uh, solar energy. We are a bit more sunny than your country. We don't have much water power, but we do have sun. But it takes again time. But when <laughs> we will be finished with the solar energy program, Maybe we will need much less gas. So to invest in, in LNG now for, a, let's say, the result in three, four, five years in the distance, and actually even the ships are needed to be built, and they are not cheap ships, mm. uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a bit, it's a bit problematic. So what we need is a green change. What we need is less energy consumption for sure. And what we need is basically planning, less talking, more planning and thinking, because what is very great now today in Europe is talking, wishing, imagining. This, these, are, these, are not, these are not leading to results. Because you look at the Russians, they wished, they, they thought that Ukraine will collapse in a few days. They are in trouble. But if we wish uh, that, that we can live without Russian oil and gas, and we try it, well, 
European economy, especially German economy, which is the heart of all European economy, can have a very tough winter and the next few winters. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. And we will have, but uh, first let's give a big round of applause for our presenter. <laughs> And now we will have an additional fika break with a lot of smurgos. Thank so you. hope you will enjoy it. I hope and then we will us. <laughs> focus on the future of Europe. So see you later. Thank you so much. It was a good one.